good afternoon. This is Martin Sokol welcoming you to Through the Opera Glass and to our fifth broadcast in the series of Tracing the History of the Metropolitan Opera. I have a very special guest with me today, Bob Tuggle, who is the Met's archivist, and because of A, the information available to him at the archives, and B, his own enthusiasm, I dare say he knows about as much about Metropolitan Opera history as anyone we're apt to find. So, Bob, hi. I'm glad you could be with us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, I think that we should have fun doing this, and I trust we'll have a very illuminating broadcast for our listeners. Good. How long have you been associated with the Met, Bob? Um, with the Met itself back to 1957 when I joined the Education Department of the Metropolitan Opera Guild. And I was there until 1977 when I began working on what was going to be a book on Claudia Muzio and became something else, a monster, <laughs> called The Golden Age of Opera. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, I believe, about to be published very shortly, is it not? Um, it's supposed to come out next September in time for the Met's centennial. Uh -huh. uh, all things willing. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the book? Well, the book is held together by the photographs of Herman Mishkin, who was the Met's official photographer from 1910 to 1932. And before that, he was the photographer for Hammerstein's Manhattan Opera for four seasons. So that during that period, he photographed most of the major singers mm -hmm. who appeared in New York, with the exception of Tetrazzini. How come he missed her? Well, nobody knows for sure, but she preferred to use a man named E.J. Foley, mm -hmm. as did McCormick at that period. And there's always been some speculation that there was a tie-in with the Irish Foley's, McCormick's wife, uh -huh. Foley. Yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, when McCormick made his debut in Italy, it was under the name of Giovanni Foley, mm -hmm. spelled F O L I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm certainly looking forward to the book. Who's publishing it? Uh, Holt Reinhardt and Winston. Uh, the pictures are only half of it. It began as a picture book, I must admit, and became something quite different because I decided to find a textual equivalent of the pictures as documents of the period and to try not to duplicate, say, quotes and information that had been published before about most of the singers. Uh, and this is what really began my work in the Met Archives, because I spent, well, it's five years now, um, going through press books, contracts, pay registers, uh, and all of Gary Kazatsa's correspondence. Sounds like an absolutely fascinating book, and I well, for it's one... Marvelous. I could spend another five years <clears throat> on it, actually. Well, I'm sure you can hardly wait until September, and I too can hardly <laughs> wait until September. I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, you also mentioned that you cut off in 1932, and indeed that ties in very well with our broadcast today, since today we're covering the decade running from the season of 23-24 uh, through 32-33. And uh, so there we are at the, at the tail end of, uh, of well, your that, era. Well, that whole 32, 33 is a very crucial period of change at the Met. A lot of singers leave in 32, and a lot of new ones come in the fall of 32, so it's... Uh, okay, well, we'll get to that at the end of this broadcast. Meanwhile, let's not <laughs> rush ahead. <clears throat> the first record that we're going to play today is from Mascagni's Lemico Fritz, which had previously been done by the company during the season of 1893-94 and was now being revived after an absence of roughly 30 years. Uh, the revival featured Lucrezia Bori and uh, Miguel Fleta in the roles of Suzelle and Fritz, and we have the recording of the Cherry Duet, an unpublished record that was made for Victor. The record itself was made on January 14, 1924, uh, it was Matrix C29285, take three. There were actually three takes of it made, uh, all unpublished. We will hear the take three. The revival performance of it took place on November 15th, 1923. And so now here is that uh, unpublished cherry duet from Lamico Fritz with Bori and Fleta. That was the cherry duet from Lamico Fritz in an unpublished recording 
of Lucrezia Bori and Miguel Fleta. I think it says a lot about the vocal riches of the period that that record was never released. Oh, it's a gorgeous record, and for the life of me, I could never figure out why that was not published. You know, Bori is a almost unique singer during this period in Avgari Kazatsa's regime, because he had a policy when a singer caused him any trouble at all of just doing without them and finding uh, a replacement. Those were the days when you could find two replacements for most mm. singers anyway. Uh, with Bori, he watched over her illness after the throat operations with the greatest of care, begged for information from Monte Carlo, Milan, when she was in Valencia, and uh, then listened to her sing before he gave her a contract again, uh -huh. and gave her what he considered a very prudent contract, those are his words, which uh, didn't force him to ha have her back, but he was obviously glad to have her back because she's She's a central figure in Mad History. I think she's one of the most exquisite artists to appear on record. I, uh, and in fact, one of these days, I'm planning to do a series on Bori in which we'll play all of her published recordings, as well as uh, a very liberal handful of unpublished. Good, some of the coloratura things. Yes, and, uh, yes. Anyhow, let's move on. That was November of 23 in December of 23, there was the revival of Giordano's Fedora. Uh, up until now, Fedora had been done only uh, at the Met, only by Caruso and Lina Cavalieri, uh, both in the house and on the road. But it was revived in December of 23 with Giovanni Martinelli and Maria Yaretza. And uh, we're going to hear Martinelli's recording of the aria Amor di Vieta, undoubtedly the best known part of the opera. The uh, recording was made, that was Amor Tivieta from Fedora. Uh, as I had mentioned, Martinelli was the first tenor to sing the role at the Met after Caruso. Caruso, of course, had been in the world premiere of Fedora uh, at, in Milan and in the Met premiere of it. I found an interesting letter in uh, the Gatti Casazza correspondence, a letter from Geraldine Ferrar to Gatti. Uh, that Mrs. Peltz had translated. They always corresponded in French, and Mrs. Peltz had translated it, and it was Geraldine Farrar being her most ingratiating, but saying, uh, why when we record, uh, when we perform Louise, must I carry the weight of the whole opera, and why are you giving me Orville Harold? <laughs> Can't I have Martinelli? <laughs> and... Uh, Gotti give, writes her back one of his classic replies because he begins with this old world graciousness and says, as delighted as I always am to see your beautiful handwriting, it was somewhat destroyed by what you had to say. And, then he, goes, <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on to explain that seasons even then were planned in advance. That's rather fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's interesting, a number of People, I think, erroneously think of uh, Caruso in Louise because of the very uh, confusing, the much reproduced of yes. uh, photograph of him in uh, in Julien. And uh, I know a number of people had uh, expressed surprise at the fact that uh, Louise was not done by the Metropolitan until after Caruso left. I think they waited with a lot of those operas until uh, Mary Garden wasn't doing them so frequently. The, well, the impression was so strong on New York. Yeah, that, that certainly would make a great deal of sense. And I don't think Farrar wanted to tempt the comparison either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could see that, uh, although I think that Farrar was such a very exquisite artist in her own right. But Farrar is an interesting artist because um, the critics like to write about her about as much as they did Mary Garden because they uh, were constantly finding she had lost her voice or regained it or, uh, <laughs> or had parts of it and not the other half. Mm -hmm. And yet, on record at least, I find her very, very lovely and uh, certainly a, a fine actress with uh, a beautiful quality to back it up. Well, I think throughout history we find that uh, singers have always saved themselves for their recording dates. Yeah, I think that this is probably true. I think we find it more today than ever. Yeah, possibly. yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you're right. And in fact, it does make a great deal of sense. The, the performance is very transient, the recording is not. 
Our next artist is Friedrich Shaw, who made his Metropolitan Opera debut in Tannhäuser, but who is, of course, best known in musical history as we have in archives. I was delighted to see that we have two Hans Ox costumes of Shaw's, which I hope we'll be exhibiting next year. I do indeed hope so. I, I imagine for the uh, for the 101st season, and I prefer to think of it that way rather than the centennial season, since mm -hmm. what we're doing now is tracing the centennial history. You know, Shaw probably had uh, provided the easiest audition any singer ever had for the Met, because he was singing a few blocks down the street on 34th Street in the Manhattan Opera House uh -huh. when Gotti heard him. He had been recommended a number of times, and uh, eventually his Berlin agent said, why don't you go down there and listen to him? And uh, he signed a contract within days of having heard him. Do you know what it was that got he heard him in? I think it was the Wolfram. Uh huh. Well, Wolfram, of course, was was his debut, although it had not been planned that way. Uh, it came about as an indisposition. Mm -hmm. But the first Hans Ox at the Met took place on uh, February twenty third, nineteen twenty four, and we're going to hear. Shores Berlin recording of the uh, finale of the last act, beginning uh, beginning, Verachtet mir, uh, a record which was made uh, on, well, in two separate sessions. It's an extended scene, and the first part of the scene was recorded on July fourth, nineteen twenty-seven. The second part was recorded on September seventh, nineteen twenty-seven. A gap of two months, but. Uh, but we do have the complete scene and the matrix numbers of the two. The finale of Meistersinger, as recorded in 1927 by Friedrich Shaw, who had made his Met debut some three years earlier, in the, uh, not in Meistersinger, but uh, in Tannhäuser, and who assumed the part of Zox at the Met on February 23, 1924. Our next selection, moving up to the next season, uh, involves a debut of a very, very lovely artist who for some reason did not seem to have had a great deal of success at the Metropolitan, that was Toti Del Monte. Well, I think she had a success. The problem was, in that time, um, Gallicurci, either with the public or the management, dominated this kind of role. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a letter relating to another singer of the same vocal prowess uh, from a couple of years earlier when Gadi Kazatza explains that um, it's not that she didn't have a success and that he didn't like her. It's just that he said that we have as many Gallicurci performances as we need and that mm -hmm. takes care of this repertory. It's, I think it's a pity, uh, particularly in the case of Del Monte, whom I think of as being such a very, very fine singer. Del Monte did make her met debut as Lucia and I guess at, at a time that Calacurci was singing Lucia as frequently as she was, that probably was rather suicidal in terms of a, in terms of a Met career. The debut took place on December uh, 5th, 1924, and we're going to hear Del Monte's recording of the Mad scene from Lucia that was recorded for Vecta on uh, May 20th, 1925. So it does coincide in terms of time with her debut just five months later. Uh, it extends over two sides, and its matrix numbers, uh, it's a Victor recording, I should add. Its matrix numbers CVE 36742 take 4 and 36743 take 2. The mad scene from Lucia de Lamamour, Toti del Monte. So, that was Toti del Monte, and our next recording is going to be her career rival at the Met, Amelita Gallicurci. Gallicurci was probably the most embarrassing single event of Gadi Kazatza's career, I would say. The story, you, no matter whom you talk to, you get a different version of what happened. But she came to New York in 1916, mm -hmm. desperately wanting to sing, offering to sing for practically nothing for anybody. And she always maintained that Gadi Kazatza did not hear her, and Gadi Kazatza said he hadn't heard her. Uh, although Giuseppe Bambuschek later told several people that he had played several auditions for her at the Met. And she eventually went on to Chicago, of course, and it was 
the, probably the most spectacular debut since uh, Rufo's, I would say, Philadelphia debut in 1912. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. And in fact, New York first heard her as a visiting member of the Chicago Company. Well, that's what made it so embarrassing, because yeah. it was, uh, I guess, the Lexington Opera House at that point when she yeah. finally came to New yes. York. And uh, it's not enough that you don't have to don't have that kind of singer who's attracting that kind kind of attention on your roster. You have to explain not only to your audience but to your board of directors why they're not there. I'm sure the board of directors is a much <laughs> sterner judge than the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gala Kurtzi figured very prominently uh, in the title role. In fact, uh, in the Dinora revival that took place on uh, January twenty second, nineteen twenty five. Uh, also in the Dinora cast was Giuseppe De Luca as Howell, and we're going to hear Galacurci's recording, not of the familiar Ombre Leger, but of the uh, less familiar, but I think more beautiful aria, Sicarina. Am I right? Is This is her New York debut role as well, isn't it? Uh, yes, Chicago yes, also. it was her New York debut role. Uh, the Met Revival was January 22, 1925, and our recording stems from a few months earlier, June 17, 1924. Uh, it's a vector record, uh, Matrix C. That was Sicarina from Maya Beers Dinora and Amelita Galakurci. Our next record is Rosa Panzel. We had heard Panzel during our last broadcast in the series doing music from La Forza del Destino. Now we're going to hear her in La Vestale, uh, an opera which she introduced to the Metropolitan. Ponzel is one of those singers who was treated, I think, more carefully than anyone at the Metropolitan by Gary Casazza. He started off with leading roles, and then he made a point of giving her at least one or two important revivals every season. And what is interesting, what I found interesting when I went back and actually looked at the reviews of all her performances was that the acclaim was not sensational from the very beginning. Everybody said, this is a magnificent voice, but she must learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. And I think she's one of the greatest object lessons in history of singing, what she did learn to do with that voice, and this record, of course, is a prime example of that. Well, as a matter of fact, it was Edward Johnson who had made a very interesting statement about this record. Uh, Johnson, of course, did sing in Vestale opposite Panzel, and on one occasion, or the story may be apocryphal, I don't know, but uh, as I've heard it, some aspiring young singer asked Johnson if he could recommend a voice teacher, and he said, yes, play Panzel's recording of the Vestale arias three times every day. Well, you know, I don't think Edward Johnson should be quoted on the subject of Ponzel, because I feel that he mishandled her career so badly. Oh, indeed, that, that certainly that, is true. Uh, in fact, I, I find it hard to believe that story. Well, perhaps it was before he <laughs> mishandled her career. <laughs> of course, there are more apocryphal stories in opera than anywhere else. Oh, sure. In any event, whether the story is true or not, it is an object lesson in beautiful singing, and uh, this is one of the two arias that Panzel recorded from La Vestale. This is Tuque and Volco. The Met premiere took place on November 12, 1925, and uh, I might note that the bass uh, during the Met premiere was Jose Mardones, who two seasons later was replaced by a debuting Ezio Pinza. What is interesting in about that is that um, Gadi Kazatza had the chance of bringing in Pinza earlier than he did. Every uh, impresario in Italy was recommending him mm -hmm. to, to Gatti. And he wrote to one of them and said, um, I don't need any a new base until Mardonis decides to leave. Is it true? Uh, the story that I've heard about Mardonis' departure was that he started suffering memory lapses and could no longer remember the words of his roles. Uh, do you have any information on that? I, I don't have anything, and of course that doesn't appear in a letter. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only thing I could think of that might bear it out, uh, of course, we, we couldn't tell this on records where presumably if, if this were a problem, Ardonis could have sung with sheet music in front of him, but uh, at the time that he did leave the Met, based upon his records, he was still in complete command of his vocal prowess, so that... Uh, 
Well, I think so, because I, I found a letter from Marian Telva in 1930, I think, to Gary Casazzo, saying she had heard him sing in Madrid, and the voice was as glorious as ever. Mm -hmm. In any event, we're rushing ahead of ourselves a little bit talking about Pinza. Here is Panzel's recording of Tuca and Voca from La Vestale, uh, a record that was recorded on May 18, 1926, Matrix CVE 3 that was Tuque and Voco from La Vestale by Spontini, as recorded by Rosa Panzel. Um, just, just one word about that. It seems to me what is really remarkable about that is not just the quality of the singing, but the fact that it's such a... If, if you remember that this is sort of the, in the depths of the Rismo, the period when it's done, it's sort of a miracle to recapture that style. Oh, sure, sure. It's such a classical style. It's uh, it's a little bit of Mozart and a little bit of Beethoven and a lot of Spontini mm -hmm. and some Gluck. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable record. And in fact, the season of 25-26, repertoire-wise, uh, I think was an incredible season because not only did the Met do its first Vestale, but it also did its first Cena della Beffe. And uh, if it did nothing else that season, it would be a remarkable season repertoire-wise. I guess wise. that is probably the only thing they really uh, made a point of doing for Rufo. And uh, interestingly enough, and it's a pity that Rufo did not make any records from Cena de la Befe, either published or unpublished. Uh, as a matter of fact, of that premier cast, Francis Alda is the only one who recorded. Uh, the others in the cast were uh, G. Lee Rufo, as you pointed out, and uh, Didor. And uh, though there are several Cena de la Befe records not to be found, but it at least in existence. The uh, Cortis record is nice. Okay. Yes, there's Antonio Cortis and uh, Hippolito Lazzaro recorded from Cena della Befe, mm -hmm. as did uh, uh, Alessandro Valente. Oh. But of the Met cast, only Alda, and uh, this too is interesting. Alda recorded two arias, uh, Sempre Così and Mi Chiamo Elisabetta. But the Mi Chiamo Elisabetta was not from the role which she sang at the Met premiere. Oh, who, who sang Elisabetta? So, I, or is that the character's name? That is the character's name. I don't recall who sang it. I'm sure it will come to me. Uh, it, was, it was not an artist of first stature. Uh, apparently it's a, a secondary role which just has an aria that appealed to Alda. And uh, so Alda did uh, did record, however, one of Ginevra's arias, the mm -hmm. Sempre Così, and that's the next recording that we'll hear. Alda survived, I think, probably the worst reviews of any major singer at the Metropolitan. Yes. And uh, the, the New York Press did this. Uh, they did it for someone who was more than uh, contractually involved with the management. They made a special point of this. And you, you hear some of her recordings from the period of her debut. You wonder what on earth they were talking about. Do you think that the reason for the attacks was because she was wed to Garikazaba? Well, it, uh, at the time of the review, she wasn't. Well, that's they true. Were just, yeah. They were just, uh, uh, I think they had the impression that they had come as a package. Uh -huh. and, uh, mm -hmm. Well, this next record, I think, is, is a very lovely record. I think it very much belies the negative reviews. And so let's hear Alda's recording of Sempre Così from La Cena de la Beffe. Uh, the record was made in 1926. I don't know the precise recording date. That was Francis Alda singing Sempre Così from Giordano's La Cena de la Beffe. And this is radio station WBAI in New York. You're listening to Through the Opera Glass, a weekly feature of the station. And I'm Martin Sokol, your host on the series. My guest today is the Metropolitan Opera's archivist, Bob Tuggle. And now, returning to our broadcast. February 17th, 1926, was a day of debuts. There were two debuts, uh, a matinee and an evening. Well, I think you might. That's the nice way to put it. I think it's one of the more ludicrous days in <laughs> metropolitan <laughs> opera history. Well, you're, you're speaking of the evening debut, I take it. <laughs> the uh, evening debut was Marion Talley, who made her debut as Gilda. The afternoon debut was someone who went on to a more significant Met career. That was Laurence Melchior. Well, uh, reverting to Talley for just a moment. She was someone who had been handled very carefully by the Met management. They had heard her, I think, four or five years sooner and uh, paid for her 
study in Italy during this period. Uh -huh. Found all the best teachers they could in Milan, and uh, brought her home for what they hoped was going to be one of the great events of Met history. And uh, of course it was, but not in quite the way they thought. Well, I mean, well it, it was it was a success. Uh, yeah. Not to. It would seem to me that the Met may very well have been looking for an as American as apple pie singer to replace. Uh, Farrar, who had just left some four years earlier. Well, I don't think there's anything in Tally, Tally that uh, really resembles Farrar. He was oh, the no. kind of repertory of the voice or the personality. So, uh, no, I, th it's I think they were looking for a coloratura sensation, and, um, and they got that momentarily. In any event, uh, we will not be hearing any of Marion <laughs> Tally today, but we will be hearing some of Lawrence Melchior. We'll be hearing him in the Hymn to Venus. Dear Turner Loeb from Tannhäuser, the role of his Met debut on February 17th, 1926. And I should point out that our recording of this uh, actually dates from a considerably later period. Uh, it dates from 1940, 14 years later, uh, November 22nd, 1940. Dear Turner Loeb from Tannhäuser, Lauritz Melchior. Lawrence Melchior singing Tannhäuser, certainly one of the major Wagnerian singers of this or any era. The um, curious thing about Melchior is how long it took him to catch on in New York, and this had nothing to do with uh, Marion Talley. Actually, the problem was that Melchior was very slow in adding Wagnerian roles to his repertoire, mm -hmm. and um, he would have been singing much more in New York much sooner if he had added Tristan Zimmer. Instead, the leading Wagnerian tenor from the 20s, of course, is Laventhal, Laventhal and sure. then uh, and well, Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff as well, mm -hmm. whom uh, came to enormous praise. He got more better reviews than anybody, uh, any of the Wagnerian tenors in the, in the 20s, and quickly went downhill until um, I, I think one of the later performances he sang, he was reviewed in, in, a, in one of the musical comedy things they were doing, the Yaritza in the mm -hmm. early 30s, and they said he's not very funny, and thus he's much funnier as Walter. Uh-huh. Uh, do you know if there's any reason why uh, Melchior sang nothing other than Wagner here? He was singing, oh, many other roles abroad. Uh, of course, he was doing Radames and Canio and Dotello and Africana. And, uh, but at the Met, he sang only Wagner. Well, I think by the time Flagstad arrives, um, he has to sing nothing but Wagner just to supply the demand. Yeah, I guess it probably is true. I mean, if you had, if you could have a performance with Flagstad and Melchior, you certainly wouldn't have. Uh, you you wouldn't do what Edward Johnson did. You wouldn't think of having Flagstad sing Norma, and you certainly wouldn't put. Uh, yeah, Melchior but still, we're and, talking and about Rodinette. ten years roughly between Melchior's but, arrival and Flagstad's. Nine years. Yeah. Um, well, there, there is not that much, actually, that he does during that period, I don't think, except Florestan, maybe, in South America. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. I think there given was a choice, I'd much, rather hear, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd much rather hear him, um, and the Otello, of course. I'd much rather hear him in the Wagner than the other thing. Yeah. The, s the same season that we're dealing with, 25-26, uh, on March 6th, the Metropolitan introduced another new work, La Vida Breve, uh, a very beautiful opera, and of course it featured Lucrezia Bori, whom I, I think was incomparable. And so we're going to hear Bori's recording of the aria Vivan los Carien from La Vida Breve by Tufalia. Should we mention at this point that uh, what we were saying while the Please. Melchior was sure. playing is the reason that Bori was not in the Goyascus uh, ten years earlier is because of her throat problems and uh, Fitzhugh was never scheduled for that performance until something like five weeks before the premiere. Yeah, I had always wondered about that as a matter of fact and it is true I think that uh, Fitzhugh had a lovely voice at least based on her very few extant recordings. Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly not be unhappy about hearing a singer like a Fitzhugh do an opera like I ask us, but oh, nonetheless, no. I and I she was, was quite a beautiful woman as well. Uh -huh. so it's, uh, it's it's another one of these myths about now and then. Uh, you know, we're supposed to have the pretty singers, and they had the big ones. And well, uh, of course, Fitzhugh was stunningly beautiful. 
Well, an ex-Broadway showgirl. And... There were, there was certainly a number of them. One, uh, one can't knock Lena Cavalieri's looks or Ferrara's. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, we're going far afield. Back to Vita Breve and Lucrezia Bori. The uh, date of the Met premiere was March 6th, 1926, and our recording dates from 11 years later. Uh, it was recorded on August 13th, 1937. That's after she retired, of course. That's after she retired, yes. Uh, the bloom is off the voice a bit. Uh, it's not as exquisite as many of her earlier recordings, and yet I, I still find it a very, very lovely performance. Uh, it's Matrix CS Vivan Los Carien from La Vida Breve. Just about a month after Vida Breve, there was another work premiered at the Met, one which received perhaps the, among the worst reviews of any of any opera that the Met had introduced. That well, I think not without reason. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take exception. I like Don Quixote. Uh, I've never seen it. I must admit. I've seen it twice. It's a very long opera that doesn't last very long. <laughs> uh, I do enjoy the music very much. We're going to hear the death scene as recorded by Shalyapin, who of course had been in the world premiere of the opera at Monte Carlo. The, uh, the brief part of Dulcinea in this recording is sung by Olive Klein, Olive who was Klein. not in the Met premiere. Uh, the, it was Florence Easton, I believe, who, who did mm -hmm. the Dulcinea. Olive Klein is one of those wonderful all-purpose singers who was current in that period that we don't seem to have very many of. Yeah. More, who could step into a recording studio and do anything. And she's very lovely on this recording, but of course the recording is totally dominated by Shalyapin. Are you going to read the Gilman review? I think I will after we hear the record. Uh, may, I, may I quote from Chatsunov before? Please do. Uh, not, that, not that this is quoting. Uh, but his, the gist of his review was that it's very dangerous to write an opera for Shalyapin, simply because it uh, lets the composer shirk his own task. <laughs> Well, of course, we will hear considerably more Shalyapin than Massenet in this in this <laughs> next selection, and we'll we'll hear more of Shalyapin than Massenet had uh, had composed in the scene because Shalyapin sings Sancho Panza's music in this recording as well. Ah, which George London did later, I think, didn't he? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, he did do mm -hmm. both parts as well. Of course, De Luca had done the Sancho Panza in the mm -hmm. Met premiere, but here is the death of. Don Quixote with Shalyapin doing two roles and Olive Klein doing a few words for Dulcinea. Uh, the recording dates from April 7th, 1927, uh, a year after the production, and it is on two sides. That was the death of Don Quixote as recorded by Fedor Shalyapin, and before we played this, my guest Bob Tuggle had referred to the Lawrence Gilman review. I'd like to read a little bit of that. This review appeared in the New York Herald Tribune. There have been brave men in France, but of them all, surely the bravest was the late Jules Emile Frédéric Massenet. This intrepid composer, gifted with the spiritual distinction of uh, a butler, the compassionate understanding of a telephone girl, and the expressive capacity of an amorous tomtit, had the courage to choose as a subject for music the greatest of all tragic comedies, the most exquisitely pathetic figure in the imaginative literature of the world. Monsieur Massenet, composer of Manon and the Meditation Religieuse, selected as the theme for an opera the Don Quixote of Cervantes, and with it he did his worst. The result of this incredible adventure was displayed to us on Saturday afternoon. Poor Massenet, that male milliner of music, what chance had he of setting the great uh, dreamer to music that would be anything but an indignity to Cervantes? The music is a prodigy of vacuous ineptitude. Its impotence is breathtaking. You wonder how even a tenth-rate composer could front such a subject, diluted and trivialized though it is in this libretto, and being himself to set down the paltry stuff that constitutes the score. Certainly not the greatest of all reviews. There's much more to that review, of course, that the annals doesn't print. Uh huh. If I may plug my book, I would like to say that uh, please the Michigan photographs of Don Quixote are much more interesting than the score. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said before, I like the score. Uh, I, I guess I'm outnumbered by 
both you and Gilman, <laughs> but I am looking forward to the review in its entirety and certainly to the Michigan photographs. So that was Don Quixote. <clears throat> November 16th, 1927, season of 27-28, there was a major revival, and that was Bellini's Norma, not heard since the days of the great Lily Lehman. Uh, it was revived for and with Rosa Punzel as Norma, and along with Miss Punzel, we, uh, the audience has heard Marion Telva as Adol Giza, Giacomo Lari Volpi, and Ezio Pinza. And the first of the two Norma recordings that we're going to hear is Lari Volpi's recording of the aria Meco all'altar di Venere. I should mention that this record has a p particularly abrupt ending and uh, to those of you listening, no, we did not cut off the, the tape in the middle or at some point. This is the way the, the record actually ends. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice display of vocalism. Uh, I personally have never been that enthusiastic over Larry Volpe, though it's a virile enough quality. The recording was made on January 16, 1928, Matrix BVE 41451, take two. In Panzel's recently published autobiography, there's an interesting story about the casting of Larry Volpe in, in this role. And she went to uh, Gatti Casazza when they were discussing it, uh, and he announced that he was giving her Larry Volpe, and she, of course, wanted Martinelli. Mm -hmm. And she finally realized from some of the from his attitude that uh, she felt the antagonism between the two singers would probably help in their interpretation of the parts of Polione and Norma. And in, in reading through the press books, I found an account of a trovatore which they had sung together in which uh, at the end of the first act, the, the trio that ends the first act, Larry Volpe had taken a high D flat and held on to it for about 12 beats as, <laughs> as, as he was as, to as, do. He, as he could do at the age of 80, I suppose. And um, of course, Ponzel was backstage in tears, having never been noted for high notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, here is Larry Volpe's Poglione, Mequel Tardi Venere, from Bellini's Norma. I told you it was an abrupt ending. Well, they don't at least give you a fake orchestral well, thing tacked on. That's true. <laughs> that was <laughs> Mequel Tardi Venere, recorded by Giacomo Lari Volpi. And next, the, the big duet, certainly one of the highlights of the score, the duet Mira o Norma, in which soprano Rosa Panzel is joined by the Adolgisa of the stage performances, Marian Telva. The recording dates from 1929, January 30th, 1929. It's in two parts, matrix numbers CVE 49073 and 074. Mira Onorma and the Cabaletta Sifin Walora, Rosa Panzel and Marian Telva. Uh, did, was there something you had? Well, it just, I think it should be pointed out that uh, at this point it was 30 some years since the Met had presented it in New York and those were the days when Norma was seemed to be reserved for something special, and uh, I think this was it. I guess Punzel was pretty special. <laughs> so here is here is the duet, a beautiful piece of music, and certainly a gorgeous recording. Mira o Norma, Rosa Punzel, and Marian Telva. Mira o Norma and Sifin Walora, recorded by Rosa Punzel and Marian Telva certainly a very, very beautiful record. One of one of those Desert Island recordings. Well, I think it's a perfect record. Yeah. Our next record is again Lucrezia Bori. It's from La Rondine. Bori, of course, had done Magda in the Met premiere. And interestingly enough, this record was made on the very same day at the same session as the Vida Breva recording of Bori that we heard a little while ago. This is not the uh, best known aria from uh, Rondine. It's not the Kill del Sogno di Doretta, but rather the uh, other aria that Magda sings, uh, Ore Dolce e Divine. And I think it's a very lovely record. The Rondine premiere at the Met was on November 10th, 1928 with Bori and Gigli. There's a curious story about that, in that um, 
The Met started negotiating for Rondonet in about 1914, when Puccini was first writing it. it. And if I'm not mistaken, the idea actually came not from a Viennese com uh, publisher, but from Andreas Dippel, who uh -huh. controlled all the American rights and about 1915 sold them to Gotti Casazza. And of course, Puccini got a letter from Gotti got a letter from Puccini saying, uh, "Do you want to do it this season?" And Gotti, of course, wrote to Otto Kahn saying, "Any other composer in the world had come to me this late, and with this offer, I would have refused him out of hand. What shall I do?" And uh, of course, the war yeah. messed up everything, and eventually, the premiere was in Monte Carlo. Right, right, with uh, Tito Schipa, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But Gili uh, sang the Schipa role at the Met, and. Bori, of course, did sing Magda, and I should mention that Rondine is very much in the air these days, since City Opera is going to be doing it during its coming oh. season. Do you, do you remember the Gili story about Rondine and his autobiography? He, no, uh, I don't. He was, um, Emma Corelli asked him to sing it in, uh, in Rome, mm -hmm. about 18 or 19, after the premiere. And Puccini had some misgivings because of Giulio's appearance, mm -hmm. and uh, he read through the score for the composer, who said afterwards, he said, um, I don't think the appearance will make much difference once they've heard the voice. <laughs> That's a nice story. <laughs> Here is the Bori recording. Uh, the record, as, as I mentioned, uh, had been recorded on the on the same date as the Vita Breva, that is August 13th, 1937, and it's Matrix CSO 11716 uh, 11, Take 1, 11716 Take 1. Ora Dolce Divine from La Rondine, Lucrezia Bori. Or just record. Well, I think that's fascinating because you. you you hear two things on that record. You hear why she was so valuable to the Metropolitan for decades, and you also see why she knew she had to leave. Yeah, yeah. Just lovely. We've mentioned Ezio Pinza before. Uh, he had made his debut in La Vestale. He never recorded anything from Vestale. But I guess Pinza really became the, the proverbial household word with his assumption of the role of Don Giovanni at the Metropolitan. Uh, this came about on November 29th, 1929. The most interesting letter, I think, in the Met archives is a letter Gary Casazzo wrote the summer before the first Don Giovanni, in which he said to Otto Kahn, you've been begging me to perform this opera for years, I think as long as Gatti had been there almost. And he said, I now have a cast for it. And he goes down the cast and says, Panzel will be done on a Rathberg, Don Elvira, Fleischer, Geely, Ludicar. And then he explains at great length why he is giving the title role to Pinza. And, you know, it seems absolutely obvious to us, looking backwards, that this is sure. the classic casting of all time. Of course. Ezio Pinza's Don Giovanni. But uh, looking forward from 1928 or so, it's not. And he goes through some of his available singers and explains what's wrong with them. And he says um, De Luca could sing the role, but he has no presence for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says Michael Bonin um, can't learn the Italian recitative. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> That's uh, interesting. Bonin had been studying it. Yeah. He had had Bonin studying it for several years. And he said um, Tibbet. Uh, had also been working on it, said, has begun to go backwards rather than forwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, because Tibbet was obviously singing marvelously at that sure. point. Sure. In, in any fact, case, the major then, part of Tibbet's career still lay ahead. And then he says, um, that is why I think uh, Pinza should sing it. And then he goes on to say about his stage presence. and. Uh, That's interesting. You mean he got it by default, really? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure, but I, I think um, I think Gotti was sort of uh, answering questions before they were raised. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it was certainly a fabulous choice, and our next selection, the Finkhandel Vino, though it lasts only a fraction over a minute, a minute and 16 seconds to be precise, has to be 
a minute and 16 seconds of the of the glorious recording ever made. <laughs> so here is Ezio Pinza's Finkhandel Vino from Mozart's Don Giovanni, uh, a truly, truly spectacular recording. Uh, it was recorded on March 28th, 1930, Matrix BVE 59732, take two. Finkhandel Vino. Quando il vino calda la festa, una gran festa fa preparar. Se trovi in piazza qualche ragazza, te con quella cerca menar, te con quella cerca menar, cerca menar, cerca menar. Entra un ordine, la danzacia, il minuetto di la folia, chi la remanna fare i ballar, il minuetto fare i ballar, chi la folia fare i ballar, chi la remanna fare i ballar. Ed io pertanto dall'altro canto con queste quella vuomore già, vuomore già, vuomore già. Alla mia lista doma mattina d'una decina devi aumentar. Alla mia lista d'una decina devi aumentar. Se tu mi piazza qualche ragazza e con quella cerca menor. Oh, alla mia lista doma mattina d'una decina devi aumentar. Senza alcun ordine la danzacia, il minuetto, chi la folia, chi la levanna fare ballare. La mia lista doma mattina d'una decina devi aumentar, d'una decina devi aumentar, d'una decina devi aumentar, devi aumentar, devi aumentar, devi, devi aumentar. <ride> That was Finkhandel Vino, very, very much too short, I think. Our next recording is a very interesting bass, one who had a long career. Uh, he was at the Met in the late 20s. The recording that we're about to hear uh, dates, uh, I, I'm not sure of the uh, precise date, but I believe it's 1943. Still very beautiful vocally. This is Tancredi Pazero. Uh, he had made his Met debut in Jocunda, and he was in the Met's premiere of Louisa Miller, which took place on uh, December 21st, 1929. And we're going to hear the aria Umya Sangue. Well, it's wonderful to think of a period that could, uh, when Italy could send you within the space of a few years, Pazero and Pinza. Yeah, that's in an the same abundance. Local register. Yeah. And eventually Pazero left simply because there was. Uh, with Pinza's popularity and steadiness. There was very little for him to do, and Gotti eventually hired uh, Virgilio Lazzari, Lazzari yeah. to uh, replace him, and also he was cheaper. Well, of course, Pazzaro's career continued on for many years, and in fact, in 1951, he was doing uh, Oberto in the Verdi uh, festivals. Well, he's still Italy. alive. Yeah, and uh, I don't know when he actually stopped singing, but... Uh, it's it's a career that did go on for a long time. At any rate, here's his 1943 recording of Unia Sangue from Verdi's Luisa Milla, uh, an opera in which he was in the Met premiere on December 21st, 1929. That was Tancredi Pazero singing Unia Sangue from Luisa Miller, and this is radio station WBAI in New York. This is Through the Opera Glass, a weekly feature of the station. I'm Martin Sokol, your host on the series, and my guest is Bob Tuggle, the archivist of the Metropolitan Opera. You know, everyone has the performances in the past they would like to go to. I would like to go back to a Don Giovanni in which Pinza was the Don and Pazero was singing Leporello. Oh boy, wouldn't that have been something. Well, we can't go back, but we will move forward a little bit to March 20th, 1931, the Metropolitan Opera debut of Georges Thiel. Uh, I, I should mention that we have skipped an important debut, uh, that of Lily Pons, who made her debut on January 3rd, 1931, as Lucia, but we will be hearing some Lily Pons very shortly in another of her major Met roles. But for now, Salut Tombeau by Georges Thiel from Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, the role of his Metropolitan Opera debut on March 20th, 1931. Salut Tombeau from Romeo and Juliet, sung by Georges Thiel. I think the only explanation for Thiel's short stay at the Met can be that he was sick most of the time he was here. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, it certainly was a short stay and a rather limited repertoire, and in fact, a, a rather uncharacteristic repertoire, since we normally tend to think of Thiel in terms of Carmens and Manons and Romeos and Fausts, and uh, I believe he did both Tosca and Turandot while he was here. Well, I think he only, what did you do, Sadko, Lakme? Yeah, yeah. He, oh. I didn't realize that he had done Lakme, though. I'm not surprised he... Uh, I do remember the uh, well, Sadko. I'm, I'm not sure. I have a photograph of him in it at the Met, but I'm not sure he sang it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anyhow, our next new production, our next major new production at the Met was the premiere, the company premiere of Verdi Simon Bocanegra, which took place on January 28, 1932. Uh, Lawrence Tibbet was the Simon in that, and the fiesco was Ezio Pinza. And we're going to hear Pinza's recording of Il Acerato Spirito. Interestingly enough, this is the first published recording that Pinza made. Uh, the recording was done on June 19, 1923, in Milan. It was his first published recording, the second recording that he committed to X, but the first recording was also Il Acerato Spirito in an unpublished version. And this is Matrix CE 1210 Take 1. Ezio Pinza, Simon Bocanegra. Il Acerato Spirito from Simon Bocanegra, as recorded by Ezio Pinza, the fiasco of the first Met performance. How old do you think he is in that recording? I think he's probably about 25. I, I think it's interesting that when you go back and look at a lot of the major singers of the past, you find that this myth of how long it takes you to develop your voice and come to absolute fruition is it varies from person to person obviously oh sure but, but the, some people begin with almost everything well uh, Adelina Potty is a good exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they take ten example yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other side of the scale there is Paul Plançon who was what 54 when he made his debut something like that Plançon, I don't think 54 uh, maybe, maybe 44 maybe I think he was more than that oh, uh, no. because he had already received a degree in medicine before he ever started to study voice, and he studied for quite a few years. Uh, he was he was certainly at an age when many singers are considering retiring at the at the time of his debut. But uh, he certainly is more of an exception than uh, than the. It, it varies from teams. case to case. Actually. Uh, our next selection is Lily Pons. We had bypassed her. Lucia debut, but we're going to hear her uh, recording of the Bell Song. Uh, Lakme, of course, was an opera revived for her, and uh, it was an opera that she sang many times at the at the Met. Uh, not nearly as many times as Eva Lucia or uh, Rigoletto, but of course, Lakme has never been that much of a box office hit. And uh, I haven't really looked at the statistics, but I dare say she probably sang two thirds of all of the Lakmes the Met has ever given her. I would think not far from that. It's um, it's almost impossible to overestimate her importance in terms of the early 30s mm -hmm. at the Metropolitan. Um, if you look at the roster of singers, that doesn't give you a picture of what was going on in terms of uh, actual box office. And yeah. She came over with uh, having been found by Guy, Maria Guy and Zanatello, and um, they had a contract in which they paid her practically nothing. And... Um, one big box office attraction like that. The experience is it brings people into the house on the other nights as well. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, the recording of the bell song that we're going to hear does date from that period. Uh, the recording was made uh, on December 4th, 1930. And uh, That's actually before the debut. Yeah, it's it? actually mm -hmm. before the debut. It uh, was recorded on two sides, matrix numbers BVE 59725 take 4, and 59726 take four. And we should mention that the uh, Lakme revival itself uh, took place on uh, December 19th, 1932. That was Lily Pons doing the bell song, and I'm afraid that we have time for only one more record, although it's a real beauty. It's uh, Tito Skipper's Adina Credimi from Elisia d'Amore, the role of his Metropolitan Opera debut on November 23rd, 1932. Skeep was one of those singers who came in in 32, 
33, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, the yeah. season after Geely. Right. And also coming in that season was Richard Crooks. Mm -hmm. And I think the real story of Geely's leaving and the pay cut and everything is that Gotti really was happy to be out of a contract which can, committed him to more money than the Met could pay at that point. Uh huh. Well, he certainly had a, uh, a fine replacement in Skipa, as, as we'll hear. Well, well, the irony of it is that Skipa is a, a singer that Gotti Kazatsa, in his correspondence at least, has been uh, deriding for the last ten years. <laughs> well, I guess you, you can't you pick all winners. You can. Right, right. But uh, here is Skipa's Adina Kredemi. I think it's a truly beautiful recording. Uh, it was made in 1928, Matrix BVE 47430. Tito Skipa singing Adina Kredimi from Elise de More. I wish we had another half hour, but unfortunately we don't. I would like to thank you, Bob Tuggle, for being with us. And Thank you, I've enjoyed it. Well, uh, I've enjoyed it tremendously. I'm sure our listeners have, and I hope you'll be back. You certainly have added an awful lot of information. The only uh, problem is this is the only period I know. <laughs> well, then we'll have to repeat this, <laughs> perhaps right. with different artists and different records. Fine. The same sort of thing. <laughs> Again, thank you very much, Bob, for joining us. Next week, we're going to do a very little-known opera uh, in its entirety, L'Etoile by Emmanuel Chabrier.